For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Towards the end of February, a meeting of the Peace, Security and Cooperation Framework for the Democratic Republic of the Congo was held in Kinshasa. The framework has been signed by 13 countries and is a regional initiative to address the violence and crisis in the DRC. However, from the very beginning, the framework has been riddled with issues of justice and accountability that have never been properly addressed. Kambale Musauli of the Center for Research on the Congo talks about some of these issues. The DRC Peace, Security and Cooperation Framework, uh, usually called in French Accord Cadre, is an agreement that was signed in, in uh, Addis Abeba uh, between about uh, 13 uh, African head of states uh, to bring about peace, security, and uh, cooperation um, in DRC. But this comes from a very particular context. In 2012, we had a rebellion in the Congo of a rebel group called the M23, uh, which is a Rwandan backed rebel group uh, that destabilized the DRC almost the entire year, uh, caused a lot of uh, regional um, conflicts, and that the nations implicated um, started getting engaged to say, after a few decades of war in DRC, there need to be something um, actually taking place to bring about peace. So the agreement, right, is about African nations, but there was a militia group. So for listeners, for viewers uh, watching this, that should understand that the conflict in the Congo is not just rebel militias uh, fighting among themselves to bring about democracy or whatever the narrative they may push. Uh, it clear, clearly shows that it's a regional problem. Uh, so the, uh, in the framework, uh, there were a lot of uh, obligations for DRC a lot of obligation around opening up political space, uh, around democracy, and so on. Now, the uh, DDR uh, program for the demobilizing rebels and so on. But there was no concrete obligation for Congo's neighbors, particularly Rwanda and Uganda. That's one of the biggest criticism of the framework, that uh, Rwanda and Uganda, who have invaded the Congo twice, in 96 and 98, and continued to support proxy rebel militias, had nothing actually in the agreement holding them accountable or creating obligations for the recidivism of them uh, conti uh, continuously supporting rebel proxy militia. The other criticism of this framework is that it puts Congo's mineral resources under control of a panel, right? That the Congo pretty much lost its sovereignty. In, um, in this framework. And uh, the last, uh, even though it's uh, kind of mentioned it on the first point, is the question of justice. Um, we strongly believe that in order for peace in the Congo to take place, there needs to be justice. Uh, there is no fundamental cl clause or obligation in that agreement that calls for justice, uh, specifically for what Congo's neighbors have done. The, continuous invasions of the DRC, the continuous support of rebel militias, the crimes that the rebels are committing on the ground. So until we address the question of justice, um, this framework, uh, this agreement, uh, will not bring about peace, security, or cooperation in the region. How do I know? Uh, this agreement was signed in 2013. We are in 2022. There is still no peace in the Congo. There is no uh, security uh, for civilians, particularly in the East. And in terms of cooperation, regional cooperation, is still not taking place in a way where it's benefiting uh, the Congolese people. Uh, there is still exploitation of the Congolese people. So these African uh, head of state decided at the end of February to come to Kinshasa to review this agreement, uh, to see um, what has been achieved. Uh, to me, um, this uh, meeting in Kinshasa uh, at the end of February of this year is more um, head of state traveling to Kinshasa, um, but not necessarily something concrete uh, where we're seeing an advancement after nine years of uh, this agreement bringing about peace, security, and cooperation in the region. The meeting was especially significant considering the recent militancy of the group Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF, in the Congo. A number of countries in the region have either sent forces or plan to send soldiers against this insurgency. How do we see the regional response to the ADF? And what larger strategic goals does this response hide? You know, it's quite fascinating that uh, in the past few years, there, there's been discussion and of uh, 
Islamic, so-called Islamic terrorists uh, in the DRC, you know, mainly pushed by Washington, uh, by the State Department and by uh, the US Pentagon. Uh, they've been saying that there is a rebel group tied to ISIS uh, in the DRC and there must be some military operations uh, you know, taking place to eradicate these Islamic uh, terrorists. Of course, I can go one by one and say how this is uh, really an equivocation. Uh, one, Congo is majority a Christian country. Uh, two, the UN group of experts have clearly shown for the past three to four years that there is no connection between the ADF rebel group and ISIS, uh, that this is fabricated inf uh, information uh, from on the parts of those who are um, mentioning that there is a connection. And three, uh, this is an anecdote uh, from um, human rights activists I just met in this past February in Kinshasa, where they share that um, if the ADF uh, tied to um, ISIS, um, it will be the first in the world that Islamic terrorists are actually stealing pigs from Congolese farmers to feed themselves. So even the locals are understanding that this is um, a, a fabrication. But even though it's a fabrication, the concrete uh, ways it has appeared in the DRC is that we have now many military operations taking place. The US has sent uh, the special military advisors to the DRC. Uh, we have Kenya, which uh, has pledged to also send soldiers in DRC. We have Uganda, uh, which uh, they have already sent um, the UPDF, the Ugandan People's Defense Force. They are in the DRC right now, uh, fighting the ADF with the Congolese military. And there are so many displacements uh, taking place there, and they're giving us narrative that they're actually fighting ADF. Um, we have the Rwandan soldiers also who are pledging to come into the DRC. The police is on the, its way to the DRC. And just uh, last week, uh, we had the Turkish president uh, who was visiting DRC, and he also has pledged to send Turkish soldiers uh, to the DRC. But looking at all of this framework, right, now all of these military engagements right, specifically, we are forgetting that Congo has been destabilized because of his, Cong uh, of his neighbors in the East Rwanda and Uganda. We strongly believe that until we address the question of justice, in the DRC, there won't be peace. We will have these symptomatic solutions to the conflict because the ADF is not a Congolese problem, it's a Ugandan problem, but you have Ugandan soldiers in the DRC. Uh, the same thing with many of the rebel militias supported by Rwanda at times and so on. So how do we address the question of justice? Let's just look at what the International Court of Justice did uh, last month in February. The International Court of Justice, after going through uh, is uh, sentencing that took place in 2005. You know, in 2005, the International Court of Justice found Uganda guilty for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and pilfering Congo's resources. They just announced the judgment uh, last month. And the judgment is that Uganda needs to pay over $300 million in reparation to the DRC for the crimes they committed in DRC. We are not discussing reparation but we are discussing military operations by the invaders. So if we don't address the question of justice, the recidivism in crimes will take place. And I'm very clear that Ugandan military operation in the Eastern part of DRC, uh, led by Museveni's son, um, Muhoza, you know, he's uh, one of the commanders of the UPDF uh, forces, uh, that their operations in DRC has nothing to do with media. He has everything to do with the oil reserve that's been found in the Beni region, all the way to Lake Albert in the DRC. And this is estimated at over 2 billion barrels of oil that's been discovered. And most of this oil is on the DRC side. So everyone wants a piece of this oil. And there is a narrative of um, you know, joint military operation to bring about peace. And we've heard this story in Afghanistan. We've heard this story in Iraq. And we are clear that in DRC, that's why they are there. And we'll continue to denounce it and call always that in order for peace, security, and cooperation to take place in DRC, we must resolve the question of justice. And this justice 
comes with holding uh, criminals accountable, holding nations destabilizing the Congo accountable. How so? By the creation of an international tribunal for DRC where the, the perpetrator of violence in DRC will be held accountable. How have successive governments of the DRC responded to such regional initiatives? Have there been attempts to stand up for the country's sovereignty? Or have they mainly functioned as clients of powerful players? We, we have to understand the conflict in the Congo in, in its proper context. Uh, in 1996, two of US allies, Rwanda and Uganda, invaded the Congo, continued to support proxy rebel militias. And pretty much since that time to today, Congo has been under tutelage. Uh, Congo's politics is decided on in the re hegemonic regional bloc um, of Central Africa. It's decided in Kampala and Kigali. Uh, on the international level, it's decided in Washington and uh, London. So there is little room uh, to the Congolese people at this time to be able to have a say in the decision-making process uh, in the country. Let's just look at the last election. In 2018, there was a rigged election. Uh, the Congolese people were clear around the result, but a regional bloc came to support uh, results that not, do not represent the Congolese people. What actually unfolded? You had South Africa, you had Egypt and Kenya, who made sure that the former president of the DRC, Joseph Kabila, and the one who was declared the winner of the election, it, uh, Felix Chisekedi, signed a secret deal in order for a so-called peaceful transfer of power uh, to take place in the DRC. But a secret deal had a few clauses, one not holding Kabila accountable, like going after his assets and crimes he committed, um, while the so-called new president continued to rule the country. So when you see that and you know the interests of the people, you are clear that Congolese people don't have a say in the, the future of the country. And the succession of uh, regimes since 1996 have been unable to do that. Um, has there been resistance from the Congolese people? Of course there have been. Throughout this entire process from 96 to today, uh, Congolese have resisted. This is also why we have a very high death toll. You know, over 6 million Congolese have died in the conflict in DRC. They didn't die just watching someone coming to kill them, they resisted. Um, and we also had uh, young Congolese, uh, many of them lost their life. There was Sichimanga who stood up uh, for a free and fair election that was shot and killed inside of a church. Um, is there a Luke Kulula, another young uh, person who was unfortunately um, burned to death uh, in, in his house. He was one of the young Congolese also fighting for a free and liberated Congo. So there have been many young Congolese who have lost their lives, many others who've been arrested, tortured, jailed um, to see that free Congo. Uh, the challenge that they face is while they are organizing a fighting on the inside, uh, the, the strength of building a Pan-African or uh, an internationalist network for support on the outside has not been as strong as it should be. And why is it important? Uh, that model is what brought an end to the apartheid regime in South Africa. An inside strategy and outside strategy to end the exploitation of South Africans, to end the apartheid regime. In the DRC, the same is needed. While Congolese are fighting on the inside, they need allies on the outside to put pressure on negative forces against the Congolese, the mining corporations, uh, Congo's neighbors, Washington and London, all these international conglomerates who want to get access to Congo's cobalt, water, and many other resources that we have. When that happens, uh, it gives them a chance to determine their affairs. But at least for the foreseeable future, uh, the battle of the Congolese is continuing to see a free and liberated Congo. It is difficult, but they are uh, determined to achieve the ideals of Patrice Lumumba. They are determined to see a free and liberated Congo because it's not just for them. As they succeed to do so, it will allow Africa to reach the next level, to develop the African continent and to make the continent much more uh, of a place of prosperity and peace, stability. Thank you.